I'm a high school economics and workshop teacher in South East Queensland and I've been speaking with my students about the difference between real value and financial value. In Australia at the moment, the financial value of a nurse is only about $65,000 a year, whereas I'd argue that their real value to society is much higher than that. On the other hand, the financial value of a Commonwealth Bank CEO is about $8.36 million per year, and I would argue that their real value to society is much lower than that. Does the panel think that the COVID-19 crisis could be an opportunity for society to better recognise the real value of frontline workers? Uh, I think we've checked that out. It's your maximum potential income is the figure that he's referring to. Does it make you reassess the value of your work compared with others this moment? I mean, I, th I don't think there's any question that we all have a great degree of admiration for healthcare workers at any point in time, but particularly at the moment, because they really are on the front line, uh, I mean, saving lives and also really putting themselves at risk. And that's why it's incredibly important that not only that they're compensated, but they're also protected. And a lot of what the, the measures that have been announced have really been designed to do is, of course, protect the overall healthcare system. I think it's very hard for a CEO of any company to sort of try and rationalise you know, remuneration levels across you know, different parts of the economy. So I'm not even going to uh, try to do that other than to agree with the premise of the question that uh, you know, healthcare workers are, are really are the heroes of what's going on at the moment. Jennifer Westacott, do you think this does make us as a society sit up and, and reflect on the way we regard some jobs and the way some jobs are paid? Oh, I think it will. I think, you know, let, we haven't even talked about aged care where people are, are really uh, putting themselves on the front line here, uh, protecting the most vulnerable people. And I think we do need to look at, you know, the funding levels for our health workers, our health system, uh, our WorkSafe organisations who are, you know, busily trying every day to get information out to companies and to individuals about how do we keep our workforce safe. I don't think there's any doubt that the way we think about work, the way we think about certain categories of jobs will change after this. Uh, and, uh, and, and that will be a good thing. I mean, for a long time, I think we've really undervalued the people who work in the aged care sector. Those people, including the, the point Matt's making about nurses, they are right on the front line. And of course, they provide an extraordinary and compassionate service to people. And I think it will be in time to pause and say, are we rewarding those people enough? Nikki Hartley. Well, look, can I just bring teachers into this? Mm -hmm. Because I don't think there's a parent in this country who isn't suddenly working out the value of a teacher. Um, yeah. You know, my kids are older, but I'm looking at my colleagues who are trying to homeschool their kids and do their jobs and suddenly appreciating the value of, of, of teachers. And it is, I mean, congratulations, what a great question and what a great teacher. Those students are in great hands because there is a huge difference between financial and, and, and intangible values to things. Um, we, we pay people what the market will bear. Economics has this whole rational theory about why things work in, in certain ways. And you can argue the same about why does a movie star get paid a certain amount. Mm. But, um, but if we're saying you know, that the world that we will uh, live in after this might be quite different to the one beforehand, will we value things like supermarket workers as essential workers in the way that we see them now afterwards? I think we very quickly forget, unfortunately. Mm. And I think... Uh, we move on to the next crisis and obviously in the middle of this, which is, which is obviously horrendous, we, we have moved on from the bushfire crisis at the moment and climate change is still a very real issue and I think humans have a limited capacity for how many things they can deal with at one time and I think we also we deal with a crisis that it is but we very easily forget. So do I think we'll have a universal basic income? No. Do I think we'll suddenly start appreciating teachers more? I wish the answer were yes. What I do think, though, is that this crisis is teaching us to do some things better. It is teaching us the value of social connection. It is teaching us that we can actually work remotely. And for women, that's a fantastic thing. The trust that we are putting in people and saying, actually, we're all going to work remotely. And we trust the flexibility that that will allow people, also people caring for their kids and saying, yeah, you can work at home and you can be flexible around that. For, for women's empowerment, this is actually teaching us some valuable lessons. So... There are some nuggets to be mined from the catastrophe that's, you know, happening around us. Yeah, I right. think that's absolutely right. I mean, we've got 23,000 people uh, at the Commonwealth Bank working from home at the moment. And 
I mean, we, we wouldn't have believed that we could scale to that level. And the way people have just distributed it has been amazing, I think, across the entire economy. And just, I think other, in other examples, people's behaviour does change really quickly as well. For example, we taped up our entire branch network, which is about 900 branches with social distancing. I was in branches on the Monday. People were sort of looking sort of curiously. By Wednesday, everyone is sort of looking for the, the square, moving to the next one. I mean, the, that whole change in and around social distancing from a matter of days in terms of you know, human conditioning, it shows actually there's some pretty fundamental shifts that are occurring. You've said you're not going to let any staff go through all of this. I think you're taking on some more. At the same time, there's all of these mortgage deferrals. How, how does that get paid for? Well, I mean, the way uh, mortgage deferrals work is, of course, we're basically putting it off. So a customer will have to pay it back just over an extended term uh, of time. And as you said, yes, well, we're an industry that would be considered an essential service. And of course, we've got lots of customers coming to us. And some of the examples that you've seen tonight are very representative of what we're seeing uh, in large numbers. And when I've been out in branches, you can see people coming in in tears and they're very concerned, anguished. There's obviously a number of people have been stood down over the last couple of weeks in particular. Uh, and of course, that causes um, us to have to take on extra staff to be able to deal with that, particularly in financial, uh, those requiring financial assistance, a lot of questions, a lot of people who are just scared and understandably are looking for reassurance. And so we're trying to bolster um, the number of people that we've got, particularly who can uh, take phone calls. And then we've been using a lot of our sort of digital channels to try and proactively outreach to our customers. We're planning on doing 250,000 calls to our elderly customers who would otherwise actually frequent the branch network uh, regularly just to make sure that we're maintaining contact because of course they've got the highest health risk and uh, are most isolated at this point in time.